Me growing a beard is as hard as you saving the world. I'm Anthony. I'm Damon. I'm David. I'm Curry. I'm Dr. Kurt's dad in space. <laughs> I'm Katie. And I'm Jim. Welcome to issue number 142 of the Crimson Cowl Comic Club podcast. Thank you, everybody, for that introduction, because I forgot to tell you what the introduction was, but it went smoothly, and now I'm kind of ruining it by addressing it <laughs> once smoothly. Okay. Well, it threw everybody off who's watching or listening that, yeah, know, yeah. that we had it down and there was no confusion. Or Yep, anything. yep. Okay. So now we have to do it again anyway, right? Uh, nah, we're good. We're good. We'll go. All right. On this issue, we have an action-packed show. We are going to do a club discussion for Batman, The Adventures Continue, issue number two. Then we'll do some weekly reviews, talking about books new and old that we've been reading. And over in the letters page, it is the first Saturday of a brand new month. And that means another round of Jacob's Birthday Battles. And this time, we've got the Joker versus the kingpin so we'll talk about that and uh who we think will win later on in the show so let's jump right over to batman adventures uh continue issue number two this is the comic that is inspired kind of branching out of the uh the batman the animated series and here is the synopsis Slate Wilson has come to Gotham City, and his arrival is making the Dark Knight very suspicious. Robin, on the other hand, thinks the swashbuckling mercenary is just here to help. Is Deathstroke a friend or foe? And what are his plans for Batman? All right. So, uh, the overall uh, recap of this, we jump right into some action with uh, Batman, Robin, and Batgirl. Uh, fighting off against a villain. We see some of the characters that were teased uh, at the end and throughout uh, the last chapter we talked about. We see them kind of uh, looking on. We've got uh, one of those characters who is kind of following up on both uh, Batgirl and Robin. We have a little family dinner for the Bat family going on. We've got... Uh, our uh, lurkers and our followers. Uh, there's just a lot of stuff going on in this uh, chapter, to be honest. Um, so yeah, that is just kind of a general overview of uh, a very action packed. So what we do in the club discussion here, we'll kind of go around and uh, people can talk about uh, what they like, what they didn't like, any questions. Is there anyone that wants to uh, dive in to get the discussion going? Oh, I thought it was really fun that we got another villain in here. We got to see Clayface. Yes. Although it wasn't my favorite of the Clayface, but it was Clayface, so that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, so, yeah, like, I think this is like the third or fourth. Ba oh, there you go. <laughs> I guess I'll use this Batman one. Batman villain we've seen? This one's yeah, Andrew, like Andrew the one. <laughs> I prefer old Basil Carlo to be Clayface rather than Matt Hagen, but... I agree. Meh. Yeah, that one I was uh, very excited to see Clayface right off the bat. Um, uh, no pun intended, that literally just happened. <laughs> um, but yeah, we see that opening action scene with uh, Batman Robin and Batman fighting off Clayface, and uh, we see that uh, our... Uh, um, uh, just completely lost his name. The Robin, the the Robin, and that's lurking in the shadows. Uh, that it would be uh, uh, Red Hood. Uh... <laughs> not Tim Drake. <laughs> yeah, not Tim Drake. That was the other one. That's the other Robin. Robin. Why can't this I think Jason it's... Todd? Jason Todd. Jason yes. Todd, but... So we see Jason Todd that we saw at the end of the last issue. That's kind of lurking and watching this, and then we uh, we've got. Uh, Mr. Slade Wilson himself, which was teased in the in the end credits of the last one that uh, Deathstroke has uh, entered the the foray here, but he kind of brings in after Robin has this little like icicle capsule thing to kind of freeze Clayface, and Slade comes in and kind of slices all the limbs, and I like how Batman just kind of walking off with uh, you know a piece of it and piece of Clayface there, but. Uh, but yeah, pretty big action scene to kick this off. Anyone else want to jump in with the scene? 
Well, I, I like the fact that there were a lot of, there's a lot of moving pieces in the stories that are going on in, in this book so far. And I think that that makes it far more interesting. You're not just focused on Batman and one villain. Um, not on, and not only that, but you have lots of other people who um, come in on Batman's side and as well. We started out in the first issue with Superman having an appearance in Batman. Now we have Robin and Batgirl kind of entering in. So there's a lot of different characters, a lot of different interactions that are all playing out at the same time. And I think that that makes the book a, a more interesting book to be able to build it that way. Definitely. And uh, about halfway through the issue, we see um, a character, which I'm going to ask our DC experts here. Are we supposed to know who this lady is that is uh, working with Slade or kind of talking about luring uh, Batgirl and uh, Robin? Do we know who this is? I do not. I do not either. So either it's something that's a brand new character or maybe some kind of character reveal that, you know, we're not meant to know at the moment. But yeah, that, that was one new character they kind of threw in there as uh, well, Slate is continuing to uh, kind of work uh, work with this person. We see that Robin's out on the outskirts, you know, Batgirl was fighting uh, Firefly. So we had another villain thrown in there. And then we have Robin that's kind of uh, watching Deathstroke and kind of has, a, has a, a little moment with him as well. This would not be the first time that the animated series universe has introduced a character, a new character into uh, the DC mainline, though, as well. Right. Harley Quinn unusual. came from. Oh, go ahead. Harley Quinn came from the the animated series, so for the and she made it made the crossover into the mainline DC from there. And it's also not unusual for Slade to pick up people along the way and make them kind of his mm -hmm. students. You know, we had that with. Uh, and Teen Titans, we had um, the one Teen Titan who Slade took under his wing and made her his um, his student. Ravager? And, yeah. Well, that was so, also his daughter, but. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, yeah. he's, he does yeah. that a lot. There's a lot of this yeah. kind of, he picks someone up, uses them as kind of a, a tool for a while, and then dumps them. <laughs> Moves on to You're someone. You're on your own now, kid. <laughs> Uh, jump over to Katie. You have uh, anything you want to talk about for this issue? Uh, thank you for asking. Overall, I just found it a fun and uh, interesting issue. The showdown at the uh, insect exhibit at the museum was pretty interesting, actually. Uh, that was a cool scene. Did not would not really pick that for a setting, but I liked it. Uh, nice turn of turn of events. Um, you know, honestly, I just found it a fun, interesting cartoon that I can enjoy reading. And, you know, it helps me appreciate the lore and the incredible history behind Batman as well and, and get more into that and appreciate that angle. But I enjoyed the colors. Uh, I enjoyed the artwork. Um, it, it's good to see Deathstroke in there. I enjoyed that. So nothing too specific, but I just had fun. I feel like I got my money's worth. Cool. cool. Uh, Damon, you had talked about that you had never seen Batman the Animated Series and you were so-so on that first issue. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Any follow-up with this one here? I haven't got it yet. Okay. <laughs> so I'll have to defer and uh, let you know on a future airing. Fair enough. Yeah, as, uh, this is one of the uh, books that was canceled on our store level as the, the shop was closing up and DC was having some things show up through Diamond yet, but then there was a certain point, even if you pre-ordered it through your comic book shop, there was a certain point where those uh, pre-orders were canceled and had to be restarted. So um, yeah, this issue, most of us, if not all of us had to get them at uh, other avenues. This is one of the digital first series um, that is available in uh, 99 cent chapters as well. And then a couple weeks later comes out in the, uh, the print version there. Okay. Um, anything else? Has anybody add? been reading it as a uh, digital? I have. How many chapters do you get for per uh, print copy? Do you know? Um, well, the first the first one that was released as number one in print came out as two, okay. um, in the digital version, and then this one came out as its own its own chapter. Okay. Oh. 
So was it 99 cents as a digital? Yep. Wow. Cause it's, it's four bucks as a book. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, they don't have any material costs, I guess, other than somebody entering it into a computer somewhere. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure with Katie talking about complementing the colors, I bet you that really is very uh, uh, evident in the digital version, I assume. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. And as it is in print as well, but with that digital screen really lets you appreciate the colors on a whole extra level, I think. Yeah, the one the one thing that digital comics, I think, lack is um to have that full page look you know you can draw out to that but then it's too small really to read anything yeah. so you really have to tap into the individual cells and look at it and then you can draw back and look at the whole page but there's still not a sense of the whole in the same way on digital comics but i agree it's, the one it's thing still a nice format i think for people and it's easy to get and usually less expensive the one uh, positive that I like uh, branching off of what you just said is that when you're reading the physical book, I get a feel for like, okay, there's two pages left. This thing's wrapping up. We're going to have a big end page, whatever. <laughs> Doing the digital panel to panel, I am not ever, I don't see the uh, page count unless I tap on it and I can see the details. So mm -hmm. when swiping, I, I kind of get lost in how far I'm actually have been reading, whether I've been reading fast or slow. And then when something happens and I find out it's the end, it gives me more of a surprise element. But, uh, and I'm not, sometimes if I have them open up to both pages, sometimes my eye will wander and be like, oh, Clayface is down over here on the next page. He's showing up yeah. in the next scene or something. But. Yeah. Well, and, and the other nice thing about digital, I think, is sometimes the layout on the pages is a little harder to follow depending on how they lay it out on a page like sometimes it goes from one page to the next page and you're reading the normal way and you go wait a minute that's you have to go back but the, when you swipe you're going to go to the next <laughs> yeah a lot of uh brian bendis written comics are designed that way and uh i at first i would think it would be an artist's choice but I think it's definitely a Brian Bendis thing because it happens with a lot of his different artists and different series where he likes to have two pages that look like you read the left one and the right one, except mm -hmm. you have to read across mm -hmm. each mm -hmm. one. Yeah. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. You just have to look for that fine panel in the, you know, the mm -hmm. crease and to see if that panel leaks over, over the other page yeah. just a tad, because then you know you have to read left to right completely. But yeah. With digital, you're able to kind of ping back and forth, and it's good for a lot of uh, new comic book readers that are kind of intimidated by, like, you know, they don't know what order to read and which word balloon, mm -hmm. and that all comes down to some of the design of the book, too. If uh, somebody who's really good at it makes it for an easy read in print, but if you don't have the letters and the balloons in the right spot, you might be not knowing. <laughs> but yeah, that all plays, plays a factor. I had noticed on some of the better edited uh, digital comics, they will, um, when you do the like the tap instead of like the full page, um, they will come into a big spread page as a whole overview and yep. then immediately zoom into the next so you can follow it and then yep. zoom back out at the end of that story page. Yep. So that you get it first and then you get the story, then you get the view again. Yeah. So, but not all of them do that, yeah. Yeah, and well, I heard of that. Um, something that I appreciate about a digital comic is that the transitions and the zooms almost make it feel like a movie. So it's a lot more immersive and you True. can imagine it as mm -hmm. a commercial you'd see on TV or maybe on YouTube or something. And I think it's pretty cool that it does that with this particular comic since the source material was a cartoon on TV. So that's a little like niche thing that I appreciate about it because it just adds to um, distinguishing digital from just reading a paper copy and making an argument for why both are valuable to the art form. Yeah, and uh, I was reading some message boards and I heard there were some rumors that for uh, the digital version for X-Ray Robot number three coming on October, when it gets to the scene of the character that looks like me, your screen's just going to stay there and then it's going to automatically save it to your wallpaper, on your phone, on your tablet, on your disc man all of that stuff on your microwave on your fridge and it's just going to be gonna my break page. your phones yeah i look forward to that so yeah just uh yeah that's just what i've been reading <laughs> okay uh any other closing thoughts on this issue before we move on 
Oh, um, yeah. We got another bat costume that was pretty cool, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was nice. When he was talking about, uh, yeah, going a little flashback about the Firefly story about Batman fight, fighting Firefly in the past. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. All right. Then that will do it for the Batman Adventures Continue. We will have issue number three coming out very shortly. It might be next week, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but when an issue comes out, we'll usually talk about it on that second Saturday that it's been out. It allows everybody to get time to uh, pick up their copies. Um, if you ever do have a late shipment or anything like that, uh, you can always just throw it out there and we can always extend it to one extra week if needed. Um, so yeah, we'll uh, continue on uh, with the Batman Adventures Continue down the road. Let's move over to the weekly reviews. All right, save the audio. Take a drink of water here before we jump right back in. Hopefully this is water and not Clayface designed as water. <laughs> okay, doesn't taste uh, mucky or anything, so. Okay, audio recording. <clears throat> here we go. Welcome to the Weekly Reviews. We're going to go all around the internet, talk about the books that we've been reading, both new and old. My first one I want to talk about is something that started uh, towards the end of November. I think it was like November, December 2018. And that is uh, Middle West, which just wrapped up uh, this past week or so with issue number 18, a series finale. Um, the overall synopsis of Middle West, I actually think I talked about the penultimate issue, um, and I've jumped in and out of the series to talk about here on the podcast, uh, continuously a series that each issue that just gets better and better. It's a story about, uh, Abel, who is a young boy, uh, coming from a broken household. Um, there's a tragedy, uh, with involving his mom. He has an abusive father. He has this uh, little fox friend, which uh, throughout the series, I wasn't sure if he was like kind of like a Stewie from Family Guy where only like one person could hear him or something. And um, But essentially, it, it was a character that was just a talking fox and it was nothing addressed. Most of this series kind of takes place in a realistic world, so to speak. But Abel kind of sets out on his own journey as he runs away from home, runs away from his abusive uh, father, and basically wants to find a new family. Throughout the series, he ends up finding, uh, coming across a traveling circus. And there's a bunch of people there that are kind of a bunch of outcasts that, uh, you know, you kind of follow the same kind of tropes when you find, you know, when someone goes and joins the circus, you know, they have a lot of those kind of um, cliches and stuff that they play into this, but there's an overall threat of this thing, this uh, disease, this power, this curse, something that lives within uh, the boy Abel, who uh, kind of can conjure up these storms and some cra crazy things happen in the sky, some crazy designs, kind of like a tattoo on his chest kind of forms. And it's this thing um, that uh, is really unexplained for a good portion of the series other than the fact that we know that his father has the same ability. So when his father uh, goes after the son uh, throughout these issues, um, the storms are really starting to heat up and get pretty bad. And you kind of see uh, how that kind of builds out of the anger and the frustration. And uh, Abel's just kind of uh, trying to figure out what, what this ability that he has somehow um, gained uh, – you know, maybe, you know, through his family since his dad has it as well. But after we meet some of those uh, circus uh, people that have become family, there's another threat of somebody who is basically stealing children and making them work on this farm that is uh, being powered by um, these weird little uh, pink energy liquid tubes that has been there since issue one. And they're just, you don't get much. What, what surprised me about the series as a whole is you don't get a lot of explanation on the world building you're just kind of thrown into it and i remember from issue one just being like "Ooh, this is some weird you know pink fuel that's in the background everywhere i'm sure they'll explain it somewhere down the road and 
it wasn't like a huge part of the story and maybe I just forgot about it over time, but it was something that there's a lot of elements in here that you just kind of accept and kind of roll with because the main story is focusing on Abel and his dad and he's kind of uh, dealing with that and kind of coming to terms with, uh, you know, the, the whole series is about him confronting his dad. So issue 18, uh, the series finale wrapped up, not going to talk anything about that issue other than the best way to describe it is that the storms were really ramping up by the end of the series. Um, I thought it was a very beautiful journey, a lot of heartfelt emotion. Um, it was just a, a story about a father and a son and about family. And uh, yeah, it's a great creative team. Scotty Young, Jorge Corona, Jean-Francois Bellou, and Nate Picos are the creative team on there. Uh, awesome, awesome series. I was very satisfying as an 18 issue whole and it felt like they got the ending that they were intending. doesn't seem like there was any cancellation. It just seemed naturally like, yep, this is where the story ends. And, uh, and yeah, I was very satisfied with it. So I highly recommend middle West. If you're, uh, looking for a father's son family story with a little bit of, supernatural element to it but uh, at the core it's about the family relationship so that is middle west one through 18 next up on the list uh damon with audio <laughs> that sometimes helps uh my first <laughs> pick this week i discovered by accident i did not know that this even existed Ooh. um and they released the hardcover version it uh, just came out, I think, two two or three weeks ago, and that is H.G. Wells' The Island of Dr. Moreau. Um, it's written by uh, Ted Adams, and it is drawn by uh, Gabriel Rodriguez. I don't know too much about Ted Adams or a lot of experience with his writing, but I know um, uh, Gabriel Rodriguez is, uh, you know, partnered with Joe Hill on the Lock and Key series. So he was the artist on that. Um, I should have probably did a little research before getting it. Um, it's only about two issues long. So mm -hmm. I think that's a little pricey, you know, in this format uh, for just two issues. But there's some special features, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, I am a fan of Island of Dr. Moreau. I've read the book by H.G. Wells. I've seen there's a lot of adaptations. The three big ones are Island of Lost Souls from 30, 1932, um, the 1977 version of Island of Dr. Moreau with Burt Lancaster and Michael York, and then uh, the one a lot of people pretend don't exist, the 96 version with <laughs> Marlon Brando and Val Kilmer, which I must admit, I actually don't mind watching. <laughs> I even own it on Blu-ray, and then I, I actually saw it in theaters. Um, the documentary on that particular version, if you get a chance to watch it, I think it's on Prime, is pretty interesting. All the problems that surrounded making that, that movie. Um, but anyways, the comic version changes some things around. Instead of, you know, uh, Edward, we get an Ellie. Um, uh, you know, the main character has become a woman. Um, a lot, of, there's several things that are changed. But a lot of the, the big, I guess you would put points from the novel are carried over into the comic. And it follows roughly in the same story. Um, if you are familiar with Island of Dr. Moreau, basically the doctor had this crazy idea. To, he was into vivisection and to try and create human forms from animals. Um, the artwork in here is pretty good. For instance, here is one of the Ooh. first encounters you see with a, a beast people as they are called um this is the leopard man and he's drinking on all fours which he's not supposed to um the, the artwork is good uh the story in my opinion flows a little too fast um this is a great story and they could have made this like a whole arc you know, six, seven, eight issues long. And it just feels like they just rushed it to get, um, to get it done, you know, in two issues. Um, that was a little set, uh, disappointing. 
But what you do get, it flows good. It, it's fast paced. It's a quick read. The art is good. The beast people look look pretty good. Um, for those that don't want to see it, look away. But here is the first meeting inside a house, the den. You get to see what a lot of the beast people look like. Um, this guy in the robe right here is the sayer of the law. If you did see the 90, uh, the 96 version, that was Ron Perlman's character. Ah. Um, it was good. Uh, like I said, it flows a little too quickly. Um, but I still, if you haven't read the book or if you have and you want to know the story, I, I'd pick it up and check it out. Uh, the nice thing with the novel is, is even though it was written so long ago, if you were to read it today, it's still very prominent, especially with what's going on in today. I mean, you know, scientists trying to keep a pig's head alive. You know, all our talk with cloning and, you know, uh, experimenting on animals, trying to find cures for humans and stuff like that. I mean, it was really advanced for when he wrote this story um, back in 1896. And it's very prominent in what's going on in our society today. Um, it is a fun story. The one thing with the hardcover is it, the first half of the book is the two issues. The second half of the book is all the artwork, his original Gabriel Rodriguez's blue pencils. Ooh, that's so you cool. have the whole story. There's no, no wording, no, no lines. It is just the blue pencils. To give you an example, I will show you that same. I got the blue pencil one. Let me get the colored one again. Yeah, I always like seeing the blue penciled version for a lot of artist style and just kind of see that very rough, you know, start to before they lay down real pencils and inks. Here's the, the, the close up of the, the picture of the leopard man drinking from the water. I don't know if that's going to transfer over too well, but here's the blue penciled page yeah, yeah. in the same, you know, same thing. You yeah, get to see cool. it almost. You get a more appreciation seeing the blue pencils because you know the, the art when it's all colored in, it looks good. It's got the sharp lines and everything, but you, you almost see a little more detail in the penciling, I think. And uh, it's really neat to page through there and see the all the panels in the blue ink. So I guess that I guess could kind of justify a little bit higher price point. And then in the back you get uh, not just the covers of the two issues, but the blue penciled covers. So for instance, on the one page here is the blue penciled cover of issue one. And here's the colored, I can't tell if you can see it, the colored cover of issue one. And then uh, you get a uh, like four or five page conversation with both Ted and um, Gabriel Rodriguez, you know, them talking about, um, they go back and forth. He originally wanted to do Ted Adams really originally wanted to do 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and the Invisible Man. But Gabe, uh, Gabriel Rodriguez is the one that suggested and pushed for Island of Dr. Pearl because that was one of his favorite stories. So who knows if that's going to be coming out more, uh, more, um, you know, uh, adaptations in the comic book world of f uh, famous stories. But uh I highly recommend getting and reading Island of Dr. Moreau. However, this is kind of expensive. Even the cover price on this is $24.99. Uh, and even on like sites like InStock Trades and that, it's still about 16 bucks. And for two issues, ugh. So that was kind of my that, fault. I, I read the original two issues. Yes. And I think they were more expensive too because oh, they really? were – they included some of that art in the back, so they had they had a little higher cover price just for the individual issues as well. Um, and yeah, I agree. It was a great, great story. I think they did a great job of giving us a look at the society of the animals who had been brought forward into a more human existence. The weakness of the book, I thought, was that they didn't do very well, I think, dealing with the interactions of the humans who were doing this. That became a kind of background to the story. And I think that's why you probably felt it a little rushed. 
we got a really good look at these creatures that are trying to figure out who they are and what their identity is about. But we didn't really get much of a look back at the people who were actually responsible for all this in some ways. Right. I, I don't think they gave enough detail as to what Moreau was doing and right. what his whole point was, what he was trying to accomplish. But um, it was great. It was a great I thought yes. two issues story. Uh, the ending ending was different from the, the yep. book and, and the movies. The, the ending, it was kind of neat how they ended it. Um, it's a different ending. But uh, yeah, if you, I'd seek it out, either the singles or the digital, or um, if you want to get the hardcover. Um, but I think it was a good adaptation and it was a fun read. I highly recommend it. Hey, Damon, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, if they were to do, like, say, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea or another H.G. Wells story, uh, do you, well, uh, 20,000 Leagues is Jules Verne, but either one of those, uh, do you think that it would work well in this adaptation? Like, did the team do a good job of adapting it? Um, yes, it pretty much uh, follows. I, I haven't read too much Jules Verne. I'm familiar with those stories, but mm -hmm. I have been, I am a fan of H.G. Wells. So, yeah, he's a good writer. Uh, so I've, you know, I've read like the War of the Worlds, uh, you know, and Island of Dr. Moreau and stuff. And uh, I am familiar with the book. I, I, I just read it again, not too long ago. I've read it multiple times. So it does follow the book pretty closely. Okay, nice. Um, they do change some things and some characters around. And of course, you know, they can't adapt everything from the book and the ending is slightly yeah. different. But I think a lot of what H.G. Wells was trying to say in his novella mm -hmm. came out in the comic. Ah, uh, very Maybe that was just me because I've, I've read this and I know the story so well. Uh, yeah. Maybe Dr. Kurt's dad, you could touch on that if you've read the original novel. Yeah, I have too. And yeah, I think they did a good job. I think they were trying... I'm trying to remember exactly how that Wells piece ended, but I think there was a little more hope in H.G. Wells. I think this yeah. was a little darker, which is pretty consistent with people who redo or doing modern versions of, of older novels. There was a more hopeful leaning in, I think, most of the classic pieces we have. And there True. tends to be a darker edge to, um, to modern pieces when they're written. Yeah, I can see that. I'd agree. At least that was my sense. I don't know what you think. Damien? Um, yeah, the, the, the ending is is different from the, the, the book. Um, mm -hmm. The book, it, it was pretty much uh, Escape from the Island type of yep. deal, and this was kind of different. Um, it does seem a little bit darker in some aspects, but the, the, the horror is still there in both oh, versions. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. The HG, even though the HG Wells, the book is over a hundred years old, it is still very readable. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like you're reading an old book. It seems like you're reading something that could have been published last month. Yeah, I agree. And it is a short read. I think it's only like a hundred and fifty some or hundred and eighty some pages. I think. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's not more long. of a novella than a book. So, um, I would highly recommend reading the book first and then reading the comic adaptation. That I think that would be fun. Mm -hmm. Ah, um, good idea. But uh, yeah, if they were to do others, like I, I if I, I think Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, my only experience with that is the Disney movie, and I don't really remember too much of that. So I yeah, would and neither do I. Up. And, I think uh, I read a, an abridged illustrated version um, for kids, and like like in the early two thousands, I swear I'm making this up, but I know they existed. There were like abridged versions of classics that had illustrations and they were hardcovers and they would sell them at the grocery store and my library at school had a bunch and I, I read it there too. See, so yeah, I agree. I, I don't remember a ton of that one though. Um, I really hope they do do something like this. Like I would love to see a lot of adaptations for a lot of them classic mm -hmm. books like 20,000 Leagues or Journey to the Center of the Earth or even though there's been several movie, a uh, couple movies, I'd love to see the comic adaptation of uh, War of the Worlds. That would be great. Um, you know, The Invisible Man, you know, a lot of those classic books, I think a adaptation would work. Yeah. Um, and I've been, I've been buying a few. They come out every now and then. And I think all of them I've read have been relatively well done because they usually get someone who really appreciates the, the original novel, 
who is a part of the process of doing the comic adaptation. I think that that's the real secret to coming up with a good version of it. And it, uh, financially, it's a good idea to do The Invisible Man because that's one less character you have to draw, so. <laughs> oh, good point. Very true, very true. Well, thank you for going there with me on that. I really appreciate uh, your thoughts and ideas. And yeah, I agree with you. I think that th those would be amazing ideas for comic books and would be very exciting to readers today still. Definitely. Cool, cool, cool. Let's jump right over to Kirby for the next one here. All right, about a month ago, I did one week I did a review on a bunch of Marvel comics. One week I did a bunch of DC comics. This week I decided to so I'm going to go through a bunch of chaos comics, and I'm going to start out with Smiley the Psychotic Button. <laughs> first, first issue here is Smiley the Psychotic Button. goes. It's a spring, spring break road trip special. And it's basically him getting together with a gang of his little buddies. Uh, his friends are Lazy B, which is a... Uh, a red M and M with a sideways B on it on his <laughs> chest. Uh, there's uh, Chubby, which is a toilet brush head. Yeah, uh, the pillbox doughboy, which is a basically a pillberry doughboy, but he's laying around with a bunch of pills with him from the pillbox. I, I swear you make all these comics up. I've never heard of these characters. <laughs> you got Art the Heart, which is a heart care a heart character with arms and legs. And there's the B guy. And then this guy is Lazy P. He chases after him. He's a brown M M with a sideways P on his chest. Uh the cops chase after him, a bunch of others while they're trying to get to Spring break down in Daytona is how I take it. And they come across a car full of Teletubby characters that are called the Tubby Boobies. <laughs> <laughs> they sit there and pass them going down to spring break. There's a little toilet. Here's the whole group together, the toilet bowl dude. And then there's Sideways B and the pill, Pillbox Dog Boy and Art the Heart. And, of course, Smiley the Psychotic Button. Of course. Uh, they go down, get in lots of trouble on the way down, and then they just want to hook up with the girls and have some fun, do a wet t-shirt contest and all that. Of course, the cops are after them, so they get in a bunch of trouble with that. And People are shooting. The pillbox dough boy can take a few shots because he's made out of dough. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't want to give away all the stuff, but some people may or may not make it out of this alive. They have Bunch of confrontations with the uh, tubey boobies <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> and so they party down, have a good old time, but some things happen in the end. I don't want to give away. So if you want some fun, check it out. And then you got these are just two different covers. But this is Smiley the Psychotic Button number one. And I'll give you a little synopsis from this so you can get the idea of Smiley. But the story so far is. Join us for a reckless joyride through the fan fantasy-filled mind of evil Ernie's best bud, Smiley, the psychotic button. Our circular maniac revels in delusions of grandeur as he dreams he is a night king in the days of old, but all is not happy in the castle, Smiley. Although he has a vast army, a plethora of servants, and a bevy of beauties at his back and call, he doesn't have his heart's desire, Lady Death. He must win her at all costs, and in the end, it cost him plenty. In this one, Smiley dons a suit of armor, because he's just a little button. This way he gets his arms and legs and can be human size. And he goes on fighting battles, just his, his, his dream world while he's just sitting on Evil Ernie's chest while Evil Ernie's just cruising down the road, and he's just dreaming this all up. and. Just there and gets into all kinds of battles, turns into super sized smiley and stuff like that. Just it's tons of fun. And then at the end, of course, he's like he gets all excited because he thinks he's getting close to Lady Death and hooks up with her finally. And of course he wakes up and he's just sitting on her evil Ernie's chest, just flowing in the wind. So. <laughs> 
But yeah, Smiley's a blast. I've never seen anything his that I didn't like, but goes on all kinds of wonderful adventures for just being a little tiny button. <laughs> yeah, I think it's very fitting that he is uh, over at Chaos Comics. Yep. <laughs> it's been perfect. <laughs> <laughs> all righty uh then we're gonna jump over to dr kurt's dad for the next one we have iron man 2020 number five um when i started reading iron man 2020 i was somewhat skeptical <laughs> when tony stark kind of gets bumped out of the front spot of the comic you have to wonder what's going to happen but i have to admit it's been pretty interesting um what we have so far up to this point is that uh, Arno Stark, Tony's brother, has gotten Arno or uh, Tony kicked out of the company because he's not real. He's just the virtual Tony Stark, who is created after Tony was had died. Um, and Arno's took over the company because he is afraid something's coming. We don't know what the something is but he has to rally all the robots and humans together to fight whatever's coming. His first plan is to take, to wipe out all the robot intelligence and make them all um, kind of like slaves to his, his effort that he has to stop whatever this is. That fails due to um, Mark I, who's really the virtual Tony Stark, who leads a robot rebellion. Um, so then Arno goes, well, then I'll just take over all the humans' minds instead um, and control them and use them along with the robots to stop whatever's coming. Um, so that's been the plot so far. This was a great issue mainly because it gives us the return of Tony Stark. And with my background, you can't see it very well. <laughs> but um, Tony actually comes back. They find a way to bring Tony back for real <laughs> um and he comes back and comes to take the company back from arno with his new armor which i'm not going to give away if you want to see tony's new armor then you have to read number five of iron man 2020 because this is you would not imagine <laughs> what his new armor is and it, it's kind of interesting to you know, they've been playing with Iron Man's armor for years and years, upgrading it, moving it. Well, this is kind of a change from what they've been doing with his armor. So that was, I think, interesting and creative. And the, and the story ends with what Arno's been fearing has come. And we don't know what it is. But now it's going to be up to Tony to stop it. <laughs> And we'll have what one more issue, I think. Yeah, one more this? issue, and there have been a lot of there have been side pieces of it that have been in other comics. The only other side piece that's coming out is uh, I Wolverine number two, before you get to um, Iron Man twenty twenty number six. Well, cool. Yeah, I've been enjoying the series as well, and then uh, yeah. I'm very much looking forward to that uh, conclusion. So, well, were you surprised by? I was surprised with the new armor. That was like, wow. Yeah, I was on the same <laughs> what page. A, too. What, what a concept! I'm not sure whether I like it more than the other armor. There's a side of me that doesn't, but it was yeah. certainly creative. To... <laughs> I agree 100. <laughs> percent I was surprised to walk into a room and hear Dr. Kurt's dad talking about a side piece. <laughs> yeah that, yeah that took a turn so not that way <laughs> <laughs> all right sounds good then we are going to jump over to uh jim for our next review with the audio please you surprised me i wasn't expecting to be up yet oh yep yep okay um I have de de Deceased Dead Planet from DC. This is uh, the continuation of the zombie stories that they've done for the last about year. The original book was called Deceased, and then they had uh, another follow-up where the were called The Unkillables, which was mostly villains, but some others who just couldn't die and stay, stayed around on Earth to save as many people as they could. And this is the third full series. There is an anthology series in the middle that I haven't 
gotten around to checking out yet. But um, this one sets, takes place five years later. And um, we open up, we see a little bit of a flashback on what happened to the heroes and some of them anyway, and what's going on now. We see uh, that Cyborg's head had been ripped off and thrown away and is laying in a junk pile someplace. And John Constantine is at the Oblivion Bar drinking himself into oblivion and remembering all his friends who have been killed or lost to the anti-life equation. And then all of a sudden, Cyborg's head wakes up and sends out a signal to, into the universe. And it is received thousands of light years away, wherever it happens to be at the planet that the survivors from the first series ended up on. They have founded a new Earth called Earth 2. And I don't believe it's supposed to be the Earth 2 that we're familiar with, but it's that's what they call it. And uh, the new heroes, or some of them new, some of them old heroes, have formed a new Justice League. Uh, they are fighting for the human survival there. Uh, Lois Lane is the president of the humans, and they end up receiving the signal that Cyborg sent out. And it is up, the new, basically the new heroes say, are say, we have to be the Justice League, we have to go get them. Or go get him anyway. And some of the others are not quite sure, but in the end, the Justice League takes action and they fly back to Earth to begin the rescue of Cyborg. And there's a few cute moments where you see uh, a good re reunion between some old friends. Uh, not the friends you expect. There's uh, one of my favorite characters is kind of in here again. Uh, in the original series, uh, Hal Jordan was killed and his ring passed to uh, Dinah Lance. So she becomes black, green, canary lantern. <laughs> so she's, yeah, so yeah, she's a really good one. And for some reason, I don't remember this happening in this before, but she had uh, the sword from, I believe Bobo had it in um, main story, where the magic sword. From Justice League Dark. Um, yeah, that sword. Um, and she passes it on to, um, she hands it off to uh, Oliver in this book. So that was kind of cool. And it, it's set up for, a, like I said, the Justice League returns to Earth, and they're set up for a major battle against the zombies now. Yeah, those books. And this are one really... was. Go ahead. This one ended up with another dramatic and frightening death scene. Uh, just a terrible-looking murder of of one, one friend by another old friend. So. Yeah, it seems like those uh, titles have been pretty uh, well received across the board. Like, I haven't really heard anything bad about them. Seems like they're just a lot of fun and, yeah. Absolutely. They're good. All right. Um, I'm up next here with my next pick, which is uh, Wicked Things, issue number three. Um, before I'll do that, because uh, the first issue came out uh, before the pandemic, so I'm just going to kind of refresh uh, with issue one here. 19 year old Charlotte Grote has her whole life ahead of her, headed straight to Oxford and a future as a real detective until she, she's framed for murder. All right, wicked things. We're up to issue number three. This is a character that spins out of the Giant Days universe, but it still uh, tells its own separate story. She is this teen detective who uh, doesn't really care about awards because apparently there are awards for the best teen detective. And when her mom <laughs> opens up a letter and realizes, hey, you've been nominated, suddenly she is very excited about being uh, in the running for a teen detective award. So her interest completely changed once she realized she's actually could win the prize. She, uh, she goes to this um, award ceremony where she gets to meet a bunch of other uh, detectives from different age groups. 
she's kind of excited. There's a bunch of like celebrity detectives within uh, this core group here. This is a, what the Giant Days universe has created. Is just it's a realistic world, but it's just infused with a lot of comedy. So there's just a lot of just uh, crazy, over the top uh, comedic antics. Nothing that jumps the shark or breaks the fourth wall or anything like that it's just that there's just a lot of heightened comedy in these books and uh she meets one of her idols in that first issue where uh he needs a translator i think he is a japanese um detective so she gets invited to his table for breakfast and she's just kind of gushing she's not going too crazy but she's gushing over uh, how much she admires his work and the translator for some reason has this ulterior motive of uh, not translating uh, correctly which turns off this Japanese detective and he quickly has to leave and he finds a great exit line um, uh, which he doesn't want to outright offend her so he just stands up and goes I wish to leave. I am displeased with my egg as they're eating breakfast. And then he just leaves. And uh, she's just all confused being like, what did I say? And because she was uh, being misinterpreted on purpose. Um, but what happens, what's crazy is that this detective actually is in, uh, invites um, Charlotte to his hotel room for a discussion, but she finds him dead and she is framed for that murder. That all happens in issue one. Issue two, she's brought into uh, into the investigation. There's these weird, uh, she's still kind, there's, there's no evidence of her, hard evidence to keep her, you know, locked up or anything. But in order to keep her on watch and help solve the murder, they've kind of recruited her to kind of help with her skills because she has, um, she actually did win the award for Teen Detective, but she wasn't there to accept the award because she was being framed for murder. Uh, but the police have uh, realized that she could be an asset in order to find out who really did the murder, and that's where things get crazy in issue number three. I think this is a, a five or a six issue miniseries, but yeah, it, it's very fun. It's very crazy, very silly. Um, once again, it's its own, can exist in its own read. So if you haven't read those 40 or 50 some Giant Days issues, which is a very <laughs> small part of that, um, but you don't have to uh, have read any of those to appreciate this. So if you are into detective stories, if you like, uh, you know, if you're into that Nancy Drew-esque stuff, but with a lot more comedy, um, then I think this title is very... Uh, very much set uh, to your liking for that. Uh, but yeah, it's a lot of fun. I dig it. I want more. And I think we'll get at least two, if not three more issues. So, um, yep. Crazy fun uh, UK detective. Uh, that's what it is. That's Wicked Things issue number three. <laughs> All right. We'll jump over to Kirby for the next one here. All right, we're going to focus on two of the main characters from Chaos in this round. Yeah, Lady Death and Evil Ernie. Start out with Lady Death here. This is the untold tales of Lady Death number one. The eternal night of the dark millennium fast approaches, and with it the final triumph of of Abaddon incarnation of the of the abyss. Sorry, I'm in a dark. My light's not coming on, so I can't see well. And the creatures of the night. For months since her defeat of Abaddon's high priestess, Nocturne, Lady Death has studied Nocturne's grimoire in the hope of finding a way to turn back the coming tide of darkness. But for once, she has taken re recess from that work to indulge in contemplation of the past, for this night is All Hallows' Eve and holds a special meaning for her. And these, this and the Big Eel Ernie are both Halloween specials. Uh, 
this one takes you back to the beginning of Lady Death. Start of her origin story and how she died and what happened, how she became the curator of hell and how she hooked up with Cremator, introduces her you to the first blade that Cremator makes for her, which is called Darkness, that she requests so she can slay her father who put her through all this. And uh, it's a great story, gives you lots of the upbringing, the basic storyline and stuff. Gets pretty deep into it. She ends up battling quite a few demons and creatures throughout here. And then you get a little an ending with her and the cremator. Uh, so if you want to learn a little bit more about Lady Lady Death, check that out. That's the 90s version. And then I'm going to give the synopsis for the little guy here. This is a Ash Can Edition, Evil Ernie Straight to Hell prologue for which was a five-part uh run that they did for evil ernie story so far if you don't know evil ernest fairchild was severely abused as a child a scientific mishap and some supernatural tampering by the ravishing lady death led to his ability to reanimate and control the dead it also led to the special bond he had with her Evil was resurrected in Washington, D.C. on Halloween, where he proceeded to spread Megadeth. Since then, his army of the undead has sworn the East Coast. Recently, the vampiric goddess Purgatory casts a spell severing the special bond that Ernie, Evil Ernie and Lady Death share. It has been a lon lonely time for the Evil One. He is obsessed with contacting her. In this story, it's a Halloween story. Evil Ernie, just all his Legion of the Dead are just on a rampage, taking out the cities. And he's just taking a little dream nap in the cemetery, hoping because when he's in the dream world, him and Lady Death can make contact and he can be with her and he's not alone. <clears throat> but for some reason, he doesn't understand why he cannot get old Lady Death because he doesn't know that that bond has been broken thanks to purgatory. But uh, it's a fun little story, great little prologue. I did read the regular series, and that was a good series also. But, uh, yeah, it's basically the start of where the whole East Coast is being taken over by Evil Ernie because he's going to spread Megadeth, which is basically going to wipe out the whole planet, just take over everything, kill everything off. But so far, he's basically got, there's, well, you'll see that in the future, but there's like a border wall blocking off the East Coast that they've only taken over so far to that, to that point. Then this is an Evil Ernie Wizard one half special. Nice little uh, glow in the dark cover Ooh. with the broken glass from the TV and stuff. <clears throat> but in this one, he's, I'm going to read the first few story boxes give you a concept of what's going on here, but welcome to the psychotic states of America. October 31st, 1997. Liberty lost, freedom dead. The eastern portion of the greatest nation in the world, the greatest superpower, is vanquished. 97 million Americans are dead, killed in a firestorm of supernatural madness and ultraviolence. But they're back. They're walking. They're ghouls and they serve the master of the psychotic states, the grand messiah of the undead, evil Ernie. And he is pleased, as every hope, every sentiment, every wish, every promise is decimated, ground into, into dust. He smiles. The American dream has become the American nightmare, and the world, the world stands poised on the brink of annihilation. It basically shows him announcing to the world that, yeah, you guys got a wall up, but we can blow it up. We could walk through the wall anytime we want, send legions of the undead into the world where all these people are just living their life, act, thinking they can watch TV and nothing's going to happen, even though there's 
ghouls on the other side of the wall. The children are all scared. There's children out Halloween trick or treating and stuff. <laughs> it's like they're just acting like it's a normal world, even though half the United States is taken over by ghouls. But it's one little story. It gets down to the kids knocking on the doors, and all the lights go out, and then it just goes to the end. It's like <laughs> leave it to your own imagination of whether Ernie sends the ghouls after everybody or not. So it's just a fun little Halloween story. So. <laughs> All right, cool, cool, cool. Uh, because I skipped him, let's jump over to Damon for his next pick. <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, I have Something is Killing the Children, number eight. I believe this is, I don't remember number seven too well. I believe this is the start of the new arc, new, new storyline. Um, and not much goes on in this book, I must say. I was a, I was a little disappointed. It's more of a, a kind of a setup, um, moving all the pawns into place, and it looks like things are really going to get going on the next issue. But uh, you, you deal a little bit more with the kids, uh, the one that was shot in the hospital. Um, there's a couple other key players that make appearances. I don't want to give too much away because I know several of you are reading this. And uh, I don't know if everyone's read it yet or not. But I've read uh, you read it. Okay. Uh, how about you, Jim? Are you still reading something that's killing the ch children? Uh, volume. <laughs> yes, but I'm not sure what number I'm on right now. So let me, I'd have to look at the cover there again before I just knew. That looks different than I've seen, so. Okay. Um, at any rate, it's still a great story. I'm not going to give anything away. It, it, it's still a good story. Uh, like I said, there isn't a lot of action in this one. It's more of a setup. Uh, but you do need to read it if you're following along. Um, it is a great series. I highly recommend if you are not reading it, to start reading it. I think a trade is either out or coming out soon. Um, and yeah, something is killing the children, but we still don't know what that something is. All right, sounds good. Then if we were to jump back to the order, we're going to jump over to uh, Dr. Kurt's dad. Right, and I think I'm going to leave space for a minute. <laughs> so oh. you can see a couple of things I'm going to show you here. Um, the next comic is uh, Spider-Man Noir. Um, Number two, I don't know if anyone else, else is reading this. I, I love detective noir stuff. I don't even know why. It just is so, <laughs> so out there in some ways to have a detective who's just narrating this story as they move along. Um, to give you a little flavor of what's happened so far, um, for people who don't know, Spider-Man noir is in an alternate dimension from our Spider-Man. This is someone in the Spider-Verse. Um, it's New York City, 1939, in an era of monsters, mobsters and monsters, crime and corruption run rampant through the city streets. For a time, the people were protected by the Spider-Man, a masked vigilante who could climb up walls and swing from webs while brandishing a Colt 45. Um, after one of the waitresses from the Black Cat nightclub turned up dead, there was only a single lead for private eye Peter Parker to follow, a cicada gemstone clutched in the dead girl's mitt, which led him to a beautiful museum curator, the dead dame's sister, Yuma. After a flash attack outside his Aunt May's house, Peter and Yuma hit the skies for a globe-trotting adventure to solve the mysteries behind the cicada stone and the murder of Yuma's sister. Um, it really is kind of this great detective story. To give you the, the kind of detective noir um, sort of sense of it, um, the, comics, the, comic, oops. <laughs> the comic starts with, um, with Peter narrating. They're, they're moving along, and he says, All women are mysteries. All men are detectives. Uncle Ben once told me that. The mystery in seat next to me smells like one of those little cookies that come with a chocolate egg cream at the soda fountain. Who knew trouble could smell like sugar? Uh, <laughs> the typical film noir sort of dialogue that goes on. Um, 
it's a great story with uh, Yuma and Peter, who Peter is an interesting character in the Spider-Man Noir series because he's still got some of the wisecracking sort of elements of Peter Parker, but he's much more hard bitten than um, than uh, Peter Parker in our universe. I mean, he's tough. He's he is your typical sort of film noir detective. And they are now moving across the world trying to get information on this gemstone, which leads them to have to go to Nazi Germany. Um, and so they have to find their way into Nazi Germany through various people who can lead them in. In the process, the gemstone gets stolen from Peter, um, kind of like the whole Maltese Falcon sort of thing. And so they finally get to Germany, and this is the piece I wanted to show everyone, um, where they meet Electro. And this is what Electro looks like Ooh. in Spider-Man <laughs> universe. Not the Electro we're kind of used to, um, but a very different Electro. Um, so I just, anybody who's a fan of film noir sort of stuff, this is like the perfect kind of merger of that sort of um, genre with comic book sort of stuff. And so I've just loved it so far. Everything they've done with the Spider-Man Noir, I think has been great. Um, this series has been especially good, I think. So you love a mystery, you love a hard, hard sort of detective guy like Peter Parker, then this is the book for you. <laughs> Excellent. All right, then uh, we're going to jump over to, is it the Chaos Stack? Is that correct? Yep. Yeah, this is a, kind of an introduction stack to get you into the Chaos, which is nice. Uh, they have the Chaos Galleries out there. They have a couple different ones, but just all the beautiful artwork for you in one catalog. Just tons of great pictures in here. So if you... Want to get some more art from the Chaos Catalog? That's the way to go, and you can easily take them out and frame them if you like. They also have the Chaos Bible, which is a great way to get into your. It gives you all the the creators' uh, backstories. You get to learn about all the right, all four of the writers, anchors, and stuff. Uh, you got all the individual care. Well. Not all of them. They're, they got a good variety of the characters in here, but gives you a synopsis of each character. At least the main characters are in here. And then there's a nice little uh, story about what would happen if Evil Ernie actually did end up taking over the whole world and if he won out with his megadeth solution what would happen and there's also a story of the separation of heaven and hell in here fun little sh couple nice little short stories and then you have a nice map kind of giving you the concept of what's gone on so far what's happened throughout the east coast where the border is and what's going on on the west side of the border but it's basically the map of the united states of aee after evil ernie so that's a nice way to get all your information if you don't know anything about anybody and then i read the three issue run of chains of chaos give you a quick little story thing as a from the second book here, talking about the first issue. Vampirella and Dervish lead a dance macabre raid against the stronghold of the Cult of Chaos. They interrupt a mystic ritual and hear rambling prophecies foretelling the coming of a new dawn and the rise of the Chaos Child, the personification of the Chaos God. At the same time, the dance macabre's psychic tractor, tracker Gaga, becomes overwhelmed with the force of the chaotic vision. While tra traveling the reality stream, the scientist and mystic, mystic Reston Dane detects an overwhelmingly evil presence. His symbiotic armor, the demon skin known as, known as Slow, determines that an entire reality has been dominated by chaos. 
a feeble rebellion against the forces of the Chaos Child is being led by the vampire warrior Bloodfang and alternate reality versions of Adam Van Helsing and Pendragon. As the Chaos Child plans to invade and conquer other realities, the only hope of stopping him lies in restoring the fabled light of darkness to the Chaos World. In our reality, that heroine is known by another name, Vampirella. I've never known anything about the Rook or anything, but this is a really interesting story. I didn't expect it to be that great. By looking at the covers, didn't really grab me and stuff. The interior artwork's real nice. Uh, the Rook is a character that has like a symbiotic skin, but he can talk to it. It's a living skin. They talk back and forth. There's another character with a symbiotic skin in here. There's a couple baby childs in water tanks that mentally telepathy let them know everything that's going on and stuff. It's a very strange world beyond here. But uh, you bring Vampirella into it. The skin is just, I really like the way it works. I mean, it's a lot like the Venom skin and stuff like that, but it's just like one point he's getting shot at by a, a bunch of men and the skin's just popping up grabbing the bullets out of the air and stuff like that a bomb gets placed he throws himself on it the skin absorbs all the force of everything and is so that way no one gets killed like Vampirella and all them that were around the explosion it's just and then the demon lord can control the blood and any type of blood pools and stuff. It's just, it's quite the storyline. Lots of characters. Lots of unique versions of things that were used in Marvel and DC and stuff. But, but yeah, it's Chains of Chaos. Great Bam Perella story. And a great introduction to the Rook. And a few other characters I never heard of were in here. So, check it out. Cool, cool, cool. Um, this uh, episode of the podcast brought to you by Chaos Comics. Uh, use the offer code uh, Kirby for 50% off your entire order. <laughs> this is not a real ad. <laughs> okay, we're going to jump over to Dr. Kurtzdad for your last title. Yep, Once in Future. Um, this, when I started this, it was really uh, a pleasant surprise. It's uh it's an interesting combination almost. Has anybody else been reading this? Because you can help me with, describe this. This this is an interesting combination of like Reds and and King Arthur stories. <laughs> Guy named Duncan is sucked into all this intrigue of an evil group trying to bring back um, the Arthurian kingdom for their purposes to England. Um, and he's sucked into it by his great aunt this older woman who's a part of a secret society that's been trying to thwart people who've tried to misuse Arthurian magic um, throughout the world and so suddenly he's now supposedly the, the chosen one <laughs> to um, protect the uh, protect the heritage of the Arthurian kingdom um, and he he's just kind of half the time clueless as to what's going on, but he always seems to come out on top. What was interesting about this, this particular issue is we start to expand out of just the Arthurian legends to a wider sort of um, reading of that medieval sort of literature because uh, the person who's sent to get rid of him this time is Beowulf um, by these forces, who we finally have found out are led by... Um, led by Merlin, a kind of evil Merlin, who is um, playing behind the scenes, making things happen. So at one point, uh, Beowulf shows up and tips over the car. He and his, his aunt are in, and his aunt goes, well, distract him while I set up a trap. And Duncan's like, well, what do I distract him with? And she hands him a spear and goes, stick him with the pointy end. Uh <laughs> <laughs> and so De Duncan kind of steps out there to take on this huge, powerful creature that keeps uh, keeps yelling that um, 
my fists are like hammers and my heart like an anvil. And his aunt says, good luck, Duncan, be careful. I hear his fists are like hammers. Um, so Duncan takes off to take him on. And while he's barely surviving, his aunt shoots Beowulf in the back with a high powered rifle. <laughs> That's her trap. Um, his aunt all along is this, this incredible older woman who's an expert on all kinds of weapons and, uh, and explosives, and she's usually the one who has some brilliant plan. Um, so this just continues the story of how Duncan now is catapulted into this whole battle, not just with Arthurian legends, but now with other legends from that period that are also being used in our um, in in this battle to take over England. And this the issue ends with this wonderful picture. Grendel. Oh. <laughs> so you just got rid of the one guy who actually defeated Grendel. <laughs> um, so now poor Duncan will have to face this in the next issue. But I love it because I, I love Arthurian legends. Um, literature from that period is, I think, really fascinating. Um, and they've done a really good job of merging that into a very interesting story. So if people have a passion for that kind of literature, for that kind of mythology, this is really a great, great um, merging of that into a comic book story. So cool. All right. And for our final uh, pick of the week here, Kirby. All right. We uh, ended it with Armageddon, four part run from chaos comics of course this has all your characters i don't think they left out many <laughs> just about everybody's in here the story so far hell has risen up in las vegas and strange events are beginning to occur around the globe lady death has declared war on both heaven and hell the mississippi wall has crumbled and evil ernie's undead armies are advancing to the west the judgment war between heaven and hell is about to begin. Armageddon is coming, and there is little hope for the survival of human humankind. Welcome, fiends, to the long-awaited beginning of the end. This is a great, I would really love to see this in movie format. It's a, it's a fun battle. You got tons of, you got a giant tentacle creature, you got, that comes through a, a rift and just starts every time he appears just basically wipes out a whole area and you got crop circles that turn into giant monsters and stuff that just start coming out of the ground yeah all the different chaos characters fighting together and they have other factions coming in to fight them but then they start working together or they don't and they just keep battling out trying to just wipe out everything and yet stop things from being wiped out completely purgatory gets totally killed but brought back by a demon and she has to work for him for a while to try and take out lady death and her forces there's the giant tentacle creature that thing's got lots of different minions that come out of it oh here's a better picture of it but uh but yeah it it's basically the end of everything you know it from chaos comics up until the end of the 90s this ends the complete overall run and starts everything i knew starting in the two th in 2000 so I'm not going to give away the complete ending and stuff, but it's a, it's a massive battle between everybody. You'll see people going in and out. I'm not saying if anybody dies, who lives or doesn't live or anything like that, because you should read it for yourself. But yeah, this is, this ended this group of chaos comics and from DC Marvel beat DC, but chaos destroyed them all so far this was everyone i read i there was not a single bit of disappointment 
And I just randomly, randomly grabbed that pile out of my stack of the Chaos comics. So Chaos is in the lead. Who knows? Top Cow might be next. We'll see what happens. What <laughs> I want to know is why there. when hell breaks into our world, it's always in Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah, Las Vegas always gets this. Most in Marvel Comics recently with Doctor Strange having hell break in, it was in Las Vegas. Back quite a few years, the demon in DC Comics, when he, when the forces of hell were breaking out, it was outside Las Vegas. Vegas must be... <laughs> it happens in Vegas, stays in Vegas, and eventually festers <laughs> until it explodes. <laughs> and in this one, maybe you uh, kind of flip past the oh. page... What's that? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, maybe you flip past the page, but uh, is Ben Affleck in this comic at all? No, I didn't recognize him. Is he one of the creatures? Well, yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I wasn't sure. That if was kind of, they didn't go on a rock. They, they didn't have anything to chase down an asteroid or nothing that I see. Okay. <laughs> but I see these pages, and I'm like, hey, I got a misprint copy. You know, it's like the cover's in perfect condition. <laughs> this page is all messed up. You go to the back page, and oh, this one goes white. But uh, <laughs> the back page is all messed up on the inside and the back cover. Oh man! And I'm like, oh, what the heck's going on here? It's like, Get your refunds. Yeah, I'm like, cool. I got a rarity. It's gonna be worth a ton of money, but. Then I realized they just kept as they went towards the end of the fourth issue. Each one just got more broken up than the other one. <laughs> Thought I had something special. Yeah. <laughs> like a double stamp coin. All right. That will do it for the weekly reviews. We have one more segment, and that is the letters page. All right. Not doing too bad. It's just about six. Yeah, I think we should wrap up at a decent time. <coughs> Save, record, and here we go. Welcome to our final segment, which is the letters page. It is the first Saturday of the month, which means another round of Jacob's birthday battles. He said he was going to try to be here this week, but he's not here. So uh, we are going to jump in without him. Um, this month's uh, bout is going to be between... The Joker versus Kingpin. And to kick us off, I'm actually going to uh, read the answer from uh, Eric, one of the Crimson Call Comic Club members that jumps in from time to time. His answer is this. I would have to say the Joker would win, hands down. Kingpin's strength is that uh, he leverages people that his adversaries care for as blackmail or as punishments. Such as tactic is not uh, such a tactic. Hold on, such a tactic <laughs> is not very useful against the Joker, as he is far too chaotic and detached to truly care about anyone. So that is Eric's answer. There, does anyone have a uh, answer for this match? I will Just jump in. Katie. Oh. Go ahead, okay. Katie. All right, thank you. I'm going to go with the Joker just because he's so chaotic, and that always terrifies me because it's hard to predict someone who is consistently dishonest, and depending on which Joker you go through will vary from, um, you know, manipulation to actual physical violence, and sometimes all in between. So I think he would win. Very good. Let's jump to Kirby. Well, I'd have to say Joaquin Phoenix versus Vincent D'Onofrio. I'd have to give it to Vincent D'Onofrio mm, for sure go. on that one. <laughs> and they're both psychotic. They both have their <laughs> minions that help them do things. But overall, I mean, Kingpin's, he's held his own pretty well with Sp Spider-Man and Daredevil and stuff. And the Joker, Joker's always getting caught, always getting in trouble, always having – <laughs> haven't had that extra bit of help, so I'm gonna have to give it to the kingpin. Okay, um, let's go with uh, Damon. Uh, volume. I don't know too much about uh, kingpin. I read more of the DC side, so I'm gonna have to go with the Joker. Well, you're wrong. Not not necessarily, you know the uh, 
Joaquin Phoenix Joker, but other I t- other versions of the Joker. Um, oh, D'Onofrio would kick Jack Nicholson's butt too. <laughs> no way. <laughs> no one messes with Jack. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I think the Joker. He he. I, I like I said. I I can't really a- answer it. I don't know too much about Kingpin, but I don't think there's any limit to what the Joker would do. I don't think there's any line that he would cross. And I don't know if Kingpin has that same same attitude about trying to accomplish his goals or the deeds that he does. But um, and between the two, I think the uh, Kingpin would be or uh, the Joker is the more interesting character. And so he'd probably attain uh, more followers or more. I, I don't know. I I don't know a lot about Kingpin to really answer it. I'm just gonna go with the Joker because he's one of my favorite comic book villains. Yeah, and I think if uh, the Jack Nicholson version were to uh, come up against uh, any version of the Kingpin, he'd probably just say, where does he get those wonderful suits? Yeah, I was waiting for something like that to come up. He's known for his suits and his fancy clothing, but not really so much with his toys. So I think on that front, if you think, uh, you know, Joker's into the pranks, um, Joker would find that uh, Vanessa is definitely a hot button issue, which I think would drive in some more energy for kingpin and once again he would overpower him in strength but the joker just seems to have too many things up his sleeve and and he can take a beating too and he would just laugh off uh, a giant beating from kingpin so at while it would be a slugfest and joker getting his butt kicked ultimately it'd be the mind games that i think joker would uh, take that win uh let's jump over to dr kirkstead this is a really hard one because what you've got is psychotic rage, <laughs> which is really what the Joker is about. Um, facing cold, determined logic. Um, the Kingpin is a really cold character who is willing to do nearly anything to achieve his ends. So you have those two varying sorts of people they're almost opposites in their approach to how they carry on their their criminal activities Um, but I have to go with a quote from our Batman adventure today remember Jason Todd's watching the action and he says um, rage rage has its pluses in this job only thing about rage is it's sloppy easy to turn back on the attacker um and that's why i would probably pick the kingpin the joker is often sloppy in how he does things that's why he loses to batman all the time um and the kingpin is precise exacting um and for the most part my guess is the kingpin probably wouldn't get his hands dirty at all though they both have minions the kingpin hires criminals who are at the top <laughs> of the the pyramid, where the Joker tends to hire, you know, wacky um, lesser minions to carry on his job. Um, so overall, I would just give it to the Kingpin by a small amount because I think the Kingpin, with his logic, with his um, with his criminal organization, with everything that he's got going for him. And with a grim determination, because the Kingpin does not give up easy. We saw that, especially in the Daredevil run. Um, Eventually, he would find a way, even if it looked like Joker beat him for a while, to beat the Joker down at some point and um, and, and crush him. To To the Joker, this is all a game. To the Kingpin, it is no game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, excellent answer. Uh Jim. I know probably even less than anybody else about Kingpins, so I'm just gonna go with this. Joker because Joker has almost stalemated with Batman almost all the time. Yeah, I mean he might get caught, but he gets out and he comes up with another plan and everything else, and they've been tied in this battle neck and neck for all these years and Batman has beaten everybody else. So therefore Joker. 
All right. And even uh, Scooby Doo caught the Joker twice. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> but he got out again. <laughs> uh, David, do you have an answer for this one? Oh, sure. Well, um, it's it's an interesting one actually because uh, um, just for the reasons that have already been stated, I mean, Kingpin is very methodical and he really plays the long game. Um, and at the same time, Joker can be capable of that, uh, but at the same time, he's really chaotic, and you never know just what to expect from him. Um, so I think the problem with the two of them against each other um, would be that for all of Kingpin's planning and, uh, and masterminding and everything, um, it's very difficult to, uh, to really plan ahead for the Joker because you never know what to expect from him. And I can see that as being a, you know, a, a problem. It's a tough one. Because in a lot of ways, I could see Kingpin actually being able to defeat the Joker. Um, but when I really think about um, all of the, the what-ifs, um, I, I feel as though that there's a greater opportunity for Joker to actually come out ahead on this one. Okay. Yeah, I think that was a pretty good boat. Uh, Jacob had asked me, uh, as he usually does, is this a good like matchup and I usually say we'll find out when we talk about it because uh yeah I thought this was a good one here where it could definitely feel like a you know a one-sided thing but I think a lot of points are really uh, brought up as we're kind of you know split down the middle uh for some of us here so so yeah thought that was a good bout there for the birthday bash so we will do another one in September and uh, we'll see if Jacob shows up for that or not all right um that will do it for this issue uh, next week's show uh, no club picks but we will discuss the Marvel and DC previews catalog for the releases in October and then for us club uh, I'm going to post a, uh, a thread where we can nominate three Marvel titles and three DC titles whether it's a mini series or even a one shot um, for club pick discussion uh, suggestions. So we'll just put three from each and we'll kind of see if we have any uh, um, that are similar and kind of just go from there because we'll have an indie title picking up in September again. So that'll kind of cover us for a little while. So that will do it um, for this issue of the Crimson Cowl Comic Club Podcast. This whole time I've wished to leave because I am displeased with my egg. I've just been sitting here. I've been an absentee ballot. I've been psychotically evil. Rendell Hungers. I've been scammed into buying a vacation package to the island of Dr. Moreau. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> and I can't do that from here, so. <laughs> okay.